I appreciate the, uh, the welcome. Uh, I appreciate being able to come up to Dev Mountain. This is actually my first time coming up to Dev Mountain. Um, but I've been very familiar with Dev Mountain over the last year and a half or so. Uh, it's just taken me a while to actually get into here to see one of your classrooms. Um, like Geoff said, I'm, uh, I'm a mobile UX lead at Domo. I met a handful of you guys last week um, when they came down for our on-site visit, uh, which we had a blast, so I recognize those faces. But for the rest of you, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Um, yeah, at, at Domo, oh man, Domo's a beast. Um, Maybe I should start back a little bit. Uh, my tradition, my path into UX was going to be—it uh, was very different than your path into UX. Uh, I started about eight years ago um, at school at BYU Idaho. Anyone from Idaho? A couple of people from. Did you go to BYU Idaho? You did. Okay, cool. How long ago was that? Three years ago. Cool. Uh, I graduated seven years ago and been up back there a couple times, but you know, Rexburg is a growing little place. Um, my path though started um, at BYU-Idaho. Um, how do I slip the size here? Cool. This is my family. Uh, I got married when I was a student at BYU-Idaho. Uh, that is probably one of the few pictures that you could find with me without a beard. I think I've had a beard every day since that day. Um, but it apparently wasn't going to happen. Uh, you've also seen my two boys. Uh, my oldest is now six. My youngest is four. Their names are Jameson and Sawyer. Uh, and about a year and a half ago, we had a baby girl. And as everyone says, she's definitely got me wrapped around her finger. Um, she's a super cute girl with a lot of personality, uh, but definitely tries to run the house. Um, like I was saying, my career started up at BYU-Idaho. Uh, I was a business major. Uh, I was in the marketing degree. I was thinking that my course trajectory was going to take me through entrepreneurship. I always was someone who, with that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, started up all those little startups that you can think of, selling things like t-shirts and whatnot, uh, which I'm sure a couple of you guys have probably done as well. Um, but that was kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to get more into the marketing role, into the advertising role. Um, that was just kind of where I thought I was going in life. I had the opportunity while I was, uh, while I was a student there. My wife and I were married. We moved into this, this housing. And after getting married, I realized that I've got to find a job or else I'm going to put my wife and I on the street. And so I was really looking for any job I could find. And fortunately, this opportunity opened up where I could go uh, do some accounting for this internet marketing startup. Um, my neighbor was the bookkeeper. She was leaving Rexburg. And the hope was that I could just kind of fill her spot. So I went in and I applied for the position. And sure enough, uh, with no accounting background, I did not get the position. So they slipped me into a different role, which was business development. And as a business development at this small startup, I was working on these internet marketing proposals. Uh, we were putting together things like uh, you know, just presentations for how somebody could really expand their PPC advertising and their SEO advertising. And while it was fun, um, it it, it kind of had a flawed strategy to it because a lot of these companies that would come to our startup, um, we knew right from the get go that regardless of what we did for them as as uh, you know as an agency, we knew that that strategy was going to fail because their branding was awful, right? Their website was terrible, and it wasn't going to be able to convert people into. I don't know, users or customers or whatever it was. So as startups, you often get the chance to throw on a different hat. You know, I threw on the different hat of design. I wanted to get more into the branding, the landing page design, the advertising design, uh, and fulfill kind of the role of business development and design at that startup. I really found, I don't want to say a knack for it, but an opportunity to grow there. So I went back into school. I was a semester away from graduating with my degree in marketing. And I decided to put that on hold start fresh and do a degree in marketing, or I'm sorry, a degree in graphic design and, and web design. That took me about an extra two years. And you know, I didn't get to learn the things that you guys are learning here in that degree. Um, we didn't get to study, I mean, what are you guys working on today? What's, what's the topic you guys are working on this, this week? Case studies. case studies. I knew nothing about a case study eight years ago. 
Um, what I did know about case studies were Harvard business case studies. You know, they were the 15 to 30 page documentation about how a business would succeed, but that was the only case study thing I ever found out about. I didn't know anything about focus groups in my market or in my design degree. I didn't know anything about surveying or anything like that. There was nothing specifically addressing UX design in my art degree that I was doing. I learned all of that in my marketing degree. So with my marketing background and my design background, I kind of found my own way into UX. I was going back into the internet marketing agency. I started applying those marketing principles of A-B testing and surveying and creating personas and all this, uh, you know, all this stuff that you guys are learning here. I started applying that from a marketing background into design and really kind of started to find a knack and some success in, well, instead of arguing what the best color for this website is going to be, why don't we just test it? You know, and it was little things like that that really kind of drove me down the path of UX design. Um, I left that startup. I went to another startup. It was called Elevati. Elevati owned uh, adoption.com, adoption.org, and a handful of other adoption-based websites. I really loved that part. Um, fulfilling work. Um, prior to that, again, it was just always kind of fluff work. But when I found that opportunity to really get into meaningful work, is anyone familiar with adoption? Does anyone have adoption close to their family or close to their home? Nobody? Uh, don't tell me, don't tell me. Jake, I remember it. Yeah, um, I've got lots of um, uh, cousins and um, and nephews and stuff. We actually did our, one of our first course projects on Oh, really? Very cool. It's a, it holds a sweet spot in my heart. Uh, I've got a handful of family members who are adopted. I've got a younger sister who was adopted. I've got nieces that were adopted, nephews that were adopted. So being able to give in that work was really rewarding. Uh, but Idaho got cold. My wife didn't like it up there. We moved back down here to Orem, and I worked for another startup called Plus 11, uh, where, again, I kind of filled this role of marketing and design. At that startup, over the course of three years, we launched, I don't know, tw about 20 apps, um, all with varying degrees of success. One of them, about half a million users. Another one never saw 1,000 users, right? So varying degrees of success, all a lot of fun. Um, so what I really wanted to get across is that as you guys are coming out of Dev Mountain, you've just got to start somewhere, right? You've got to find a place where you can start exercising your skills, even if that job description doesn't exactly match uh, what it is that you've learned here. You just got to get started. Um, I think this is important. A lot of people want to try and find the exact, uh, you know, the exact thing that matches what you've done here, and they'll postpone things or they'll they'll hold off on things, waiting to find the perfect thing, and it just might not be out there, right? So just get started. I've uh, also run, uh, I don't want to call it a design agency, but more or less a design agency uh, called Windspear Designs. I've done freelance for the last 10 years. Uh, I've worked with a handful of clients. These are a handful of them. I don't know if you can actually see that very well. You can. A um, couple of them were pretty fun. A couple of them were a pain in the butt. Um, I, I, <laughs> does anyone recognize this one down here? Incredible. Do you see that in the bottom left? Does anyone recognize that? I don't expect it. Does anyone know the name Nick Cannon? You know Nick Cannon? He does like Wild and Out. He's done a handful of movies. Uh, Nick Cannon, his personal brand is called Incredible. I've worked with Nick Cannon on a handful of occasions. Uh, had lunch with him. I mean, Nick Cannon's a good guy. Uh, he's out there. He's got a lot of ideas. That was probably one of the better highlights, uh, although the work was kind of a pain. Um, anyway, so that's a little bit of background about me. Now I want to get more into this presentation. Over the last two years, I've interviewed somewhere in the, in the range of 60 to 80 uh, students, recent graduates, uh, all for things like internships or associate job positions at Domo. I've been on phone calls. I've met people in person. Um, we've conducted probably 20 to 30 in-person interviews in the office, a lot of off-sites. Just, I've met a lot of you guys. Um, and I want to start a little bit with, mm, well, maybe kind of the state of the union, if you will. Um, you guys are going to graduate how soon? Week. Next week. Congratulations. You guys made it. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the state of the union. How many people intend to leave Utah or Salt Lake County after they graduate? 
two, two of you guys, maybe, two and a half. <laughs> OK. Uh, for those who are planning on leaving, where are you guys going? Kyle? Yeah. Kyle? Ben's from Northern California. OK. Yeah, Bay Area, Oregon. Maybe Oregon? Yeah. And what was your name? Ben. ben. Why Minneapolis? Where's your hometown? Minnesota. Oh, really? I'm from Minnesota. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I think you guys moving away from Utah, you're going to have a different story, uh, especially as you start to con consider what the job opportunities are. But if you're sticking around here in Utah County, Salt Lake County, you're going to find yourself in a predicament that a lot of students are doing or finding themselves in right now. Um, Dev Mountain, 13 week course, is that right? Um, you've got other schools out there, other boot camps out there. You've got four year degrees. You've used, I'm offering a four year UX degree. Uh, UX is a hot thing, right? Um, isn't that why you guys got into UX? There's a lot of opportunities. Silicon Slopes is popping. There's a lot of businesses that are popping up. UX is in demand. Uh, but with so many people flocking to the UX career, those opportunities for internship and associate levels positions are getting harder and harder to come by, right? That's the law of supply and demand. More people flock to it, it's gonna be harder to get those positions. Uh, it's part of the reason why we've hired five candidates over the last two years at Domo, and we've vetted, like I said, 60 to 80. Uh, we really have the chips in our court to vet as many students as we can in the process of finding the right candidate. So what I wanna chat with you guys a little bit today um, is how you can set yourself apart from everyone else that's graduating. Before we get into what I deem probably the most important piece, I want to hit on this right here. In the course of conversation uh, with a lot of people in your position, I find myself having to tell these students you're over-optimizing. I've been on a handful of phone calls. I've done a ton of different portfolio reviews. And what I get and what I see over and over again is people are spending hours upon hours and not just like three, four, five hours on their portfolio. I'm talking like 60, 80, 100 hours on a portfolio. And in my perspective, I say you are over optimizing. The, the marginal return jumping from maybe 30 hours in your portfolio to 100 hours in your portfolio, I just don't see it making any sense. I see it on the resume too. You know, should I put my experience that I had uh, working for my dad's friend on my resume? It wasn't really UX related, but I could kind of tweak the messaging so it sounds UX related. I just say like, I don't, I don't, as a recruiter or as somebody who's gonna potentially hire you, to me, it's, it's very transparent. I can see right through it. If it's not a UX job, it's not a UX job. Don't try and make it sound like a UX job. And I said, and on top of all that, why does it even matter what your resume says? I look at your resume for all of 15 seconds, and it's probably just to find your phone number or your email address. That's probably it. Uh, I see maybe you've got a pedigree of UX design, or you don't, but I'm hiring someone for an internship or associate level position. I don't expect to see three or four jobs in the UX design field. So let me just say, your resume is important, absolutely, but it's a baseline. And don't look at your resume as something that's gonna set you apart. Your portfolio, is it important? 100%. Are the case studies that you guys are learning to write important? Absolutely. The product tie, is it product tie that's doing the one after this? The meetup? Uh, Jordan Reading, she's a friend of mine. She's gonna do a fantastic job telling you guys how to create awesome case studies. Do I think it's important? 100%. But it's the baseline. Because everyone is going to learn how to create a, a case study. Everyone whether you're in this school or in another boot camp or at a UVU, whatever, doesn't matter, everyone's gonna learn how to write a case study. So if you think you're setting yourself apart by having this really robust case study, you're not. It's the baseline. So again, have a portfolio, have your case studies, have a good looking resume, but then move on. There's more important things, in my opinion, for you guys to be learning about. So here's those things I wanna talk about. Soft skills. Um, Edwin and Taylor, we talked a little bit about this last week, didn't we? When you guys were on site at Domo. Uh, I want to get further into this topic of understanding, implementing what I believe soft skills are and how they can really set you apart. And I want to start with a story. Um, this was last year, probably around this time, uh, I was opening up 
two different internship positions at Domo. And I started vetting, I think over the course of one week, I had probably 50 resumes that I was looking at. Um, as I started to look at the resumes, again, I didn't spend too much time with them because all these resumes started to look identical. Started looking at portfolios and didn't spend too much time there because they all started to look identical. Um, so I was trying to go, how do I pick who it is I want to join my team? It's difficult. I don't want to screw this up, especially since I was piloting the, the UX program, the, I'm sorry, the internship program at Domo. I really didn't want to screw it up in front of our executives. So I'm just going, how do I make the right decision? So I've used something, uh, have you guys ever heard of HireVue? You guys know what that software is? Uh, I use a program like it. If you didn't know what HireVue, maybe that was a starting point, but nobody really shook their head. So the software is pretty simple. I pose three questions. I give those candidates a link to go answer the questions and they do like a video interview without me. It's kind of awkward. You're sitting in front of a camera answering questions and I love it because I love seeing how natural people can be in front of a camera. Even if that natural is completely awkward, uh, I just love seeing genuineness in front of the camera uh, because it allowed me to see real personality of who I was gonna be hiring. It also allowed me to see some phony personality. You know, the people who jumped on the camera and went straight into like, I don't know, like YouTube personality, like, what's up everybody? Like you know, that kind of stuff. And it was just like, no, I don't need that. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, but when I could see genuine personality, I was drawn to it. So I gave those 50 some candidates links to this higher view uh, software. They did their you know, three questions and I got to see a little bit about them. And something stuck out to me in this process of doing it. I learned that while everyone is pretty much on the same page, there is a difference. When we start to talk about like cultural fit, like what is cultural fit? It's who am I gonna really connect with, right? I've got the opportunity to work alongside someone for 40 hours a week. And sadly and oddly enough, that's more time than I'm gonna spend with my wife and my kids. Yet we expect somebody to make the, you know, the, we expect somebody to make the decision on hiring like that. I'm gonna take my time because I'm gonna have to sit alongside you and really, you know, get to know you. And so I gotta make sure that this is gonna work. Hire view softwares like that really allowed me to see it. Something else that I did is a couple in-person interviews. And I want to tell you about this experience I had when I was interviewing two candidates at the same time. Now, some of you might think that's unfair. That doesn't sound kind. How do you interview two people at the same time? Let me just preface it by they were friends. They had actually gone through the Dev Mountain Bootcamp together. They had worked together. Uh, they knew each other really well. It was after a meetup. Um, it was probably a product hive meetup. Uh, and it was just convenient to talk to both of them at the exact same time. So we sit down, we start talking about the internship opportunities that I have. Uh, they ask good questions. We kind of you know, do the, inter or the interview thing. Um, but upon completion of that interview, something happened that has stuck with me for a long time. And it really kick-started this idea of soft skills for me. After the interview, um, we parted ways. I got back to Domo, I got down at my desk, and I got two emails pretty quickly emails from both of these candidates. It's a good thing to do, right? You just had an interview, email the person who interviewed you, say thanks. They, they understood that, they knew that, they did it. But someone was different in the emails. The first candidate who, let me just say, is a great guy, I think, I think very highly of him, uh, did the right thing and he emailed and said, Dylan, I appreciate your time. Uh, you answered all my questions. Um, I got to learn a little bit more about Domo. I got to learn about what you guys are doing. Uh, and I really think that I could benefit your team uh, I look forward to the opportunity of working with you. Um, you know, take care, right? Good email, it's, it's what you should do. The second email that I got was from the other guy. And he said almost the same thing. Thanks Dylan for the opportunity to interview. Uh, I appreciate learning about Domo and all these types of things, right? And then he said this. He said, I understand that the opportunity that you have at Domo could be really life-changing or a career setting and I know you've got a difficult decision to make and I just wanted to let you know that if it came down between me and this other student who I interviewed him with he said you can't make the wrong decision I've worked with this other candidate on a handful of occasions and he's talented he's really good and if you're deciding between me or him you won't make the wrong decision doesn't mean I don't want the position I would love it 
but just rest assured that if you hired him, you'd be in a great spot. That story hit home for me, right? And I think, I mean, does that resonate with anyone? Does that hit you in the feels a little bit? To me, it spoke volumes about this candidate's personality, his character. It was everything that I really feel makes a candidate a strong team member, putting somebody else ahead of him. Like those are things that we don't exactly address here in a Dev Mountain boot camp. We don't address it in a four-year degree. These things are what I call soft skills. Um, you learn the hard skills. You're understanding sketch, you're understanding envision, you're understanding framer or whatever else you guys are learning. You're understanding those things. And those are all hard skills and they're good but really what I think sets a candidate apart is so much more than that. It's the soft skills. Let's say you're not great at Envision. Let's say you're not great at Sketch. I can teach you that on the job pretty quickly. Let's say you're not great at After Effects. Truth be told, I don't need a whole lot of After Effects. And if I do, I'll give you time to learn it in the process. Hard skills can be taught pretty easily. Character, personality, takes a lot longer to understand. Soft skills, I think, are what set candidates apart. The first soft skill that I want you guys to recognize starts right here. When you're interviewing for an internship or associate level position, you don't have to have all the answers. I don't expect you to have all the answers. And let me show you where, you know, kind of where I see this manifest itself. You're in an interview. I'll have you do some sort of design challenge. Um, and as you're presenting your design challenge or a project that you've worked on to me, I'm gonna ask a handful of questions. Some of them I know are completely bogus questions. I know they're the dumbest questions in the world and I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. I wanna know if you're gonna treat me like an idiot. I just asked a question that you already answered. Are you gonna roll your eyes or are you just gonna answer it as if you still got some respect for me? I'm gonna ask questions that I think are really difficult. Questions that I know you probably haven't thought through because they're pretty off the wall. And I wanna see how you handle that scenario. Because in this piece right here, you don't have to have all the answers. A UX designer does not get hired on because the UX designer has all the answers to all these tough projects and tough questions. UX designer's job is to find the answers, to go through the process, to discover so when you're sitting in an interview and you get asked a question, I find it completely perfect if you just say, you know what, that's a great question and I don't have an answer to it. What I would like to do is, you know, maybe do some more interviews to find out the answer. What I'd like to do is maybe do a survey or maybe do some testing, whatever it may be. It's okay if you don't have the answer. That speaks volumes. I don't need somebody who's coming up with an answer out of their butt and throwing it in the air. I don't need that. I'm not hiring you to have all the answers. I'm hiring you to discover the answers. Number two in soft skills, take me on the journey. This comes back to being, uh, to how well you can articulate your thoughts, right? Let's say we're in that same scenario where you're applying for a position, you're in an interview, you've gone through, let's say a three hour design challenge and you went from nothing to final. And now you get up there and you show me your final and expect me just to follow along like I understood how you got there. I haven't tracked any of that. I don't get it, you know? So I need to understand how you got down this path. And one of those things that I think, again, going back to soft skills, is how well can you articulate your thoughts and how well can you take me on this journey? You know, can you tell me that I started here with these questions and based upon, I guess, what I was feeling, I then moved to this spot. I tried out these things, I, I tested this, and I made this decision, and you know, granted, I had to make a couple uh, snap choices in the design challenge, it brought me down this path. Maybe it would have been better going back to here, but ultimately I landed here. And now I'm at this spot in the challenge, and you know, can you take me on that path of how you made all these choices? I don't care just to see your final product that you know, you're gonna end up throwing up on Dribbble or Behance. I don't care just to see that. I don't care to see the pretty UI. I care to see the process that you went through. Can you articulate that process? Can you take me on that journey? Is a soft skill that I think so many forget. This last skill I wanna talk about is patience. Um, 
Why are you guys here at a boot camp? Anyone can answer. There's not a right or wrong answer. To learn your uh, skills you need in order to succeed, especially in this particular path, and just become a unit. Sure. And what were you doing before the boot camp? I was working as a startup company, as a speech, uh, for a speech therapy company. Cool. And why did you decide that you know you wanted to make this career pivot into UX? Because I found it to be interesting. It really brought my attention to know about the research process and trying to understand more about the person and having to work on a product based cool. on a person. Cool. Does that resonate with everyone? Anyone else get into this for a different reason? So I tried getting into UX from graduating from the graphic design degree. And a lot of places said that I did not have enough experience in UX design. Yep. And so I was like trying to figure out why I didn't have any. So taking this boot camp, but basically what you talked about, I didn't learn a lot of stuff that I learned here. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to take maybe a guess here. Judging by those two stories, I'm going to say that you guys are go-getters. I'm going to say that you guys don't want to sit back passively. You want to make something of yourself. You want to make something for yourself. Uh, not necessarily in the business sense, but you understand that it's not going to be just given to you. So you're going to go the extra mile to jump into a boot camp to learn the skills that you need in order to get to your next position. Sometimes I see that same personality trait struggle with the fact that this is a process and not everything is going to happen immediately for you. Patience is something that I see so many people coming out of school and just going like, where's my job? I did what I needed to do. Where's the job? Or I landed the job and now it's like, why am I not a mid-level designer yet? I've been doing this for three months. Why am I not a senior designer yet? I've been doing this for a year. And this idea of like, I've done the work, I've arrived at the pinnacle of UX design, fresh out of school, I say, slow down and just be patient. I've talked on a handful of different podcasts about my thoughts on job titles. I do think job titles carry some importance and have some weight uh, in a couple of different scenarios. But where I don't see it hold any weight is when I look at a resume or I look at somebody in the interview and these two candidates had the exact same experience and one person has this job title of senior UX designer and one person has the job title of core UX designer, right there it means absolutely nothing to me. You've got the exact same experience. The only difference is, is that one company gave you a job title that seemed a little bit nicer. At those startups I at, was at when I was only working with 10 people or 40 people, they gave me this awesome job title of creative director. Really fancy, right? It hurt me more than anything when I left the startups and tried to get a job at Domo. Because guess what? Domo's not looking for a creative director. They don't need somebody who they're going to pay 200000 a year for and manage a team of 30 people. That's not what they were looking for. They needed a UX designer. That job title of creative director hurt me more than helped me. So going back to this, uh, this idea of like, I need to get to that senior UX title quicker, um, let me just say this. It is a process. And I believe that you should strive to be the core UX designer, the associate level UX designer who blows people away over the senior UX designer who just leaves people wanting more, right? If you come into an interview and I see that you've got this title of a senior UX designer and I go, really? I've got high expectations for what I believe a senior UX designer is. But if you come in with like, you know, I've done a couple internships, I've had this associate level position, and you blow me away, I'm going, well, this guy's on the right path, right? So with your job titles, be patient. With this process of finding a job, be patient. With progressing in your career, please just be patient. This moment right here is a blip in the map, right? You've got a long career ahead of you. So just be patient and trust this process. Um, I want to, I want to wrap this up in about 15 minutes, um, but I want to spend the next 15 minutes maybe talking a little bit more Q&A. I want you guys to maybe respond to some of those things that I've talked about today. And, and maybe you've got questions that we can dig deeper into. Um, so let me go ahead and open it up. What are your thoughts on this? Do you believe that soft skills are really going to set, set you apart? Do you not buy into that? Somebody just challenge me and say, I don't buy it. Nobody. <laughs> 
Kyle. Why do you, you know, I think soft skills are really important because no one wants to work with someone. Like, like you said, you spend more time with your colleagues than you do with your family. So like, you want to make sure the person that you're working alongside of isn't going to drag you up the wall. Yeah. So no, I think soft skills are very, very important. They speak very loudly, I think. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to that, especially if you're working on a product where you need to collaborate, you guys need to have to be the same way like, in order to actually fit ideas with each other. If a person doesn't have the soft skills, it's really hard to work with that in order to deliver the kind of product. Yeah, absolutely. Questions you guys have about this? Questions you guys have coming out of school? What are your concerns? So I do plan on applying for jobs uh, from my hometown. My hometown is very small. And um, when you're hiring people, what is the disadvantage like phone calls? You know, like I'm doing interviews over the phone. Are people going to want to uh, have me fly out to places and want to get to a certain point? I don't know what to expect exactly from. You know, if I stay here, I could interview and maybe go into the their building, you know, and have an in-person interview. But in the situation I'm in, I'm probably not going to do that. Right. What, what are some of the difficulties I'm going to face? Well, I mean, over the phone, I think over a phone is just a step above a text message, right? You know, you could text something to somebody and it gets read the completely wrong way because it doesn't have tonality, doesn't have fluctuation, you don't know where the grammar should, should be. So somebody could read a text message that you have well intended and they interpret it a different way. It happens all the time, right? Phone call is just a step above that, right? So you have to put an extra emphasis on allowing your personality to genuinely shine because they're not gonna be able to see your face. They're not gonna be able to read your body language. Uh, I've got a friend who's worked in radio for a long time and he's got this saying where if you think you're putting out energy on the radio, you've got to put out three times that amount. Because on radio, your energy, your passion doesn't come through when somebody's just hearing your voice. You've got to go 3x that in order for it actually to come across the radio. I think it's the same thing on the phone. You want your genuine personality to really come across. You've got to put emphasis on being uniquely you, genuinely you, and allowing your personality to shine. Otherwise, it's just a phone call, and it, truthfully, it's a forgettable phone call. So you said that obviously you, know, you, you see a lot of portfolios um, and they tend to not be as important as some of these things. I mean, I'm sure they really are important too. But. They are important. Let me make sure. Okay. They are important. I, I got that from Okay. But it's a baseline. You should have it, absolutely. And it should be top notch. So as, as far as that goes, like you're looking at case studies um, in people's portfolios. What, what things in a case study stick out to you as either like really good or really bad? Um, so again, you're asking me, you're gonna, get my, you're gonna get a lot of differing opinions on this, but let me tell you what I look for when I look at a case study. Uh, that first point that I talk about, you don't have to have all the answers, I love seeing that come through in the case study. I love reading a case study where somebody says, uh, we made this decision at this point in time, in hindsight, really wish we wouldn't have. I wish we would have made this decision because it allows for greater flexibility or scalability, whatever the reason would have been. I like to see you okay with the fact that we made a mistake in this process and we could have course corrected here. Uh, and these were the things that I learned. If I'm not getting that, then really the case studies all just start to blend together. Um, and truthfully, I probably won't read them. I would rather have you present me your case study when you come in for an interview as opposed to me just reading it. Uh, the only thing that really ever sparks my attention is when I can read something of, I learned something doing this and we made a mistake and it's okay because I'm still passionate about this and here's how we course corrected. Yeah, here. Um, so how many people have you interviewed that came from a sales background? That is a very pointed question. <laughs> and the funny thing is that I got a very specific story to go along with it. Um, yeah, I have hired someone who came from a sales background. Um, <laughs> Ryan's laughing in the back as he's heard this story on a handful of occasions. Uh, I've interviewed, I don't know, under a dozen people from sales background, maybe even under half a dozen. 
Um, not a lot of people who come from the same sales background, but I have recognized something about all those who I, who I have recognized from the sales background. Um, they tend to be really good with words. They tend to be very flattering. They tend to say all the right things. And for me as a hiring manager, it makes it really hard for me to see, is this genuine or is it just the sale? And it's difficult. Um, I've had mixed experiences with uh, hiring someone from sales backgrounds. I've also had people with uh, you know, that very gung-ho sales personality and they think that they can come in and just push their design right through the process and I'll sell everybody on it, regardless if I'm making mistakes. And that's like the antithesis of what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring people on board. We're trying to get people to buy in, not by selling it to them, but for everyone understanding the value and then buying into the value of it. Do you come from a sales background? And how's your experience been transitioning to UX? I, the reason I got into it is because I was really successful at it and I can build value with my customers. So Focus on the value of what you're, what you're building or what you're working on. Don't try so much to sell it, especially as you start looking at the product side of things. If, if any of our UX designers ever walked into an executive review and tried to sell one of our executives on a, it would go so terribly bad, uh, I probably wouldn't allow them to present again in front of executives. It's not about, at the same time, there's, there's a bit of, the salesmanship skill that I do think you need to have is being able to get people in the room talking, right? That bit of salesmanship I do appreciate uh, because I think that can breed collaboration. But trying to just force an idea, like the used car, the used car salesman you know, model, that will never work in the product environment. So trying to push your design through will never work. I feel like that's where that first point comes in. Like, you gotta be humble about it. Yeah. Yeah, that first point would be difficult in sales, right? Yeah. If somebody's on the phone and be like, you know, I don't understand this product. Uh, how can I, uh, you know, do this and this? And you're just like, you know what? That's a great question. I'll get back to you. It's not going to fly. You're trying to close the deal. So you've got some sort of answer. That was a difficult. Like you said, you got to build that value. Yeah. So they understand. Keep it simple. Absolutely. No one else has questions. You're all just like, yeah. I got this. Coming out of school, my job's lined up. Have you noticed commonalities in those like boot camp grad versus more traditional or four year degree? Yeah, and that's actually a good question. Um, one of the things that I think you can get out of four years versus 13 weeks is just more practice, right? This is not. A revolutionary idea it's just the, the sake of more time right and in more time what I typically see somebody who's who's done who's done the more uh, collegiate four-year route is they also understand design theory like visual design theory graphic design theory principles um, I think if you've naturally got an eye for design like you consider yourself a visual designer you've got an eye for it uh, but you haven't gone the traditional route of schooling, you probably see something and you go, that looks really good, but you don't have like the principle in your mind of why it looks good, right? It looks good because you can orient yourself quickly on this website, right? But you can orient yourself quickly because there's visual hierarchy. You know, the text all stands itself a little bit different. We go something with large font and into sub fonts and to body text and it's all very visually different. So I can orient what's important, what's not important. Uh, and there's principles that go behind that. And oftentimes I see people who come into a boot camp, they miss that because it can't be a huge focus of, of what you're doing in 13 weeks. There's a lot to take in in 13 weeks. So how can you understand all those design principles? It's a difficult one to do. Uh, the other thing I'll say about practice is um, four years of degree work, you'll have a few more por portfolio pieces. Um, 13 weeks, you'll have, a, you'll, ha you'll have a handful of them, but you could do more. So I always encourage people to go online, find a website that does creative briefs or whatever it may be, uh, and just do a couple of them. Get more practice in there. You know, how many 
portfolio pieces do I expect to see? Uh, I don't care if there's 15 on your website. Three, four, five is good for me. But you're saying, well, I've already got five. Do five more and then sift out the bad ones and just replace them on your website. Does that answer your question? Do you come from a design background already prior to Dead Mountain or no? So you're wondering what else do I need to know? No, I just, I just always wonder, I mean, as we're, I'm one of the mentors, but as we're mentoring these students, um, sometimes they kind of have a little bit going against them when they're putting themselves out there. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't be equally as capable. Yeah. But yeah, they might just not have as much to show for it right yep. now. Absolutely. And you just triggered something else in, in my mind that I absolutely want to share. Um, raise your hand if you didn't come from a design background prior to this. Higher, so I can see them all. One, two, three. If you didn't, sorry. If you did not come from a design background. Okay. So what I typically see is that if people don't come from a design background, they're a little bit gun shy to get into the visual portion of UX. They kind of shy away from the UI work because it's not your strong suit. And they gravitate towards the research side. It's fine if you really have a passion for, for research. But let me just share with you, at Domo, we don't have dedicated researchers. We, all, we expect all of our UX designers to be UX designers, UI designers, and researchers along the process. We've got 12 designers, and all of our designers are pretty good at each of those steps. So if you're still a little bit concerned about your UI skill, practice daily UI challenges. Jump on Dribbble and try and make something pretty. Not for the sake of like, yeah, this is pretty, but it doesn't work. You know, I get that. But make something pretty for the sake of practicing your visual skills. Then start to incorporate that into those creative briefs where you're doing UX work and you're adding prettiness on top of it. You know, and then try and do the research and pull it all together and don't just shy away from UI because it's not traditionally your background. Try and make it part of your background. Don't just shy away from it and gravitate to research. We need it all. Here, then back to Jeff. Uh, with, the, with the opposite of that, so, so I, I do have a background in design. What should I focus more on? Because I do have that kind of it's like maybe more on the research side or like. Yep. Yep. So when I walked into my very first art class, I was the odd man out for sure. Because one of the first things that we did in these art classes is that we did uh, a redesign of a library website. And everyone threw up their redesigns on the board. And there were some gorgeous ones up there. And coming from my marketing background, I said, sure, but where's the call to action? I have no idea what to do next. Like, you know, there's what's above the fold and like all this stuff that was going through my mind. I was like, it looks good, but it doesn't work. And I think a lot of people with that design background miss the fact that we're not just doing design for the sake of design. We're trying to accomplish something. We're trying to drive some sort of action. I think research can come into hand. I think understanding the UX process is what you're doing now. But maybe you learn a little bit more about the research piece um, if you already feel a good grasp on the UI side. You mentioned that the hard skills can be learned. How can these soft skills be Practice, practice, and practice. The funny thing is, is when I've been asked, where do I learn these types of things? I say, I don't actually, it's, it's not something you have to just learn at school. You know, where have I learned about empathy? It's probably been in my family. I'm one of seven, and my family has got some gnarly issues, which a lot of families have. And I think that's where I learned empathy. Uh, I'm at the bottom of that totem pole, as, as far as my seven brothers go. Um, so being able to understand what your voice is, understand where your confidence is. Like those are things that I've learned outside of work. Um, but there's opportunities to learn them here in school too, right? You're working on a group project. And let's say one of your team members just isn't pulling his weight. Well, in a group setting, you can say, well, forget that dude. And we'll just do this project ourselves. And we're going to push through. And I'm just going to let the teacher know that he didn't do anything. And we're just going to submit this project. And we'll get a good grade. And hopefully, he gets screwed over. Um, won't work in the workplace, right? Because you've got, let's say, a product manager who may be you know, uninvolved or disenchanted. You've got to get to the heart of that problem. And instead of just saying, brushing that guy off, 
you've got to figure out what is it that's keeping him from being involved. This conflict revolu uh, resolution is a soft skill that you absolutely can learn here. We oftentimes push it aside because doing conflict resolution as part of group work isn't it directly rewarded in the grade that you're going to receive on the project. So we brush it off and just move aside to what's going to help us get the A at the end of it. But it's not going to happen in the workplace. So if you can go to that person who's not feeling involved and go, hey, I just I recognize that you're not really digging this project. What's going on? You may find out that it's got nothing to do with the project, but something that's going on at home. And say, I get it. Do you need some time? What can I do to help? And if you resolve that, do we get you back? Like those are the types of things that are soft skills I hope all my team members have. So find a way to start practicing things in school, outside of school. You can look for those places everywhere. Jeff, did you have a question or was that? I mean, that was pretty close. I, I think like a good example of that, uh, we have a fast student, so as instructor, he's the UX designer of wanting to contact Mike Curtis. Uh, did this guy in the box car, call him UX Superman. Uh, but he wrote this case study about how design thinking and the design process helped him cope with the death of his family. Yep. Right? And like, no one told him to do that, right? And it wasn't like, it wasn't necessarily a case study about, hey, this is gonna give me a job. It's just him like, this is me. This is how I use design. This is how it's helped me, right? And it's like a very moving article on Medium. I'll share it with you, but it's like, wow, this is what Mike is made of, right? And he just gets it. Yep. And you get that conveyed. And so it's not, like, not necessarily like your portfolio is always necessarily like, this is a perfect case study with great data visualization and perfect, pristine copy. It's like, put a little bit of yourself in there, right? And share a little bit about yourself that's unique, right? Not just like, I like to snowboard, play video games, and drink Rockstar. Like, it's like, show something unique about yourself. Show us how you empathize, how you connect with people, right? Like, hey, I did this, I went here, I experienced this. And it's, I don't know, I, I think, I think uh, Dylan and I have had conversations before about soft skills. It's hard to teach, but it's super, super important, and I'm super happy to focus on that today. You know, I appreciate you bringing up that article about from Mike was a fantastic article. And one of the things I think you get out of it is you understand how natural it is to him, right? And it's unfortunate that the more we talk about soft skills, and let's say the more we talk about empathy, the more empathy becomes a buzzword. So it's not just enough to say like, I know how to deploy empathy. You're now gonna have to show me how you know how to deploy empathy. What's the story that goes along with it? Where have you practiced that? How have you picked that up? Uh, because the more we just talk about it, the more it just becomes trendy. Um, if I can, let me just share one other thought that I think buzzword, networking, right? We always talk about this word, networking is important. But let me tell you why networking is important. I mentioned to you guys earlier to stop over-optimizing your resumes and your portfolios. Okay, if I stop over-optimizing, then what do I do? And I'm going to say get out there and network and get out there and meet people. Because in my career, I've yet to land a job, and I really don't believe I will ever land a job based upon my resume and portfolio. Every job that I've landed, from startup to startup to startup to Domo, to all the freelance projects that I've ever done, I've always been introduced through someone. It's always come through someone. And even more recently at Domo, uh, I got there because I had worked with some of these developers who are on the mobile team at Domo in the past. They put in a good word for me. I got my foot in the door. I interviewed. I got hired. It was right before I hired that I got an email from HR saying, hey, I just recognize we don't have your resume on file. Can we get your resume? And it's, oh yeah, here it is. That resume did nothing for me in the job process. My portfolio, yeah, I showed a couple things off when I interviewed, but it didn't do anything. It all came through knowing somebody, right? So if you're done over optimizing, what do you do next? You go to the Product Hive meetup at 1130, and instead of sitting with your Dev Mountain group, you also get out there and start meeting new people. I find it hilarious when people go to like design conferences or other meetups, and they just end up sitting with their company saying like, hey, we're networking because we're out around people. Nope, that's not networking. You know, Get out of your comfort zone, say hi to somebody, meet somebody. You don't know who you will run into. You don't know how that could, I don't wanna say benefit you later, but the relationship it will really get you so much further than just having a top-notch resume and portfolio. Bonnie. Um, the first one, you don't have to have all the answers. Do you think that's pretty, the, the same across the board wherever we might apply? Um, and, but I guess for myself, I think if I don't have the answers, then, or if I don't have the answer to a certain question, then my confidence is up and I lose down. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and um, so yeah, that. So I was very interested in that point as well, and I've been asked that on a handful of occasions. So over the last year, I've gone out of my way to uh, chat with a handful of other executives. I chatted with, you, you guys know Wade at Workfront, you've probably seen his name around. Wade and I have had ex extensive conversations. Geoff and I have talked about this. Lauren Treasure, who's down at Chatbooks, and I have talked about this. I've talked about this with a lot of different executives, and I think it's safe to say that everyone feels the same way specifically at that internship and associate level position. It gets different if you start coming in as, you know, five, six, seven years of experience, you've led teams, you've, you've got a senior title, whatever it may be. Yeah, you should start to have more answers at that point in time. But when you're new and you're getting into the, the career workforce, it's okay not to have all the answers. But it's not okay just to say like, I don't know, that's a good question. It's the next part to that is, I don't know, I don't have an answer, but I do know the process. And here's how you go about discovering the answer. So, you know, uh, Bonnie, how do you, you know, why did you make that decision? And, and if you were to try and introduce a monetization model into that app, how would you do it? Well, that's a good question. And it really, it would uh, depend on a handful of variables. What I would like to do though, is understand a handful of monetization strategies before actually giving my best foot forward on which monetization strategy we should charge. Um, maybe we need to do some more business understanding and strategy. And here's probably what I would want to ask and the questions I would want to ask and the executives I would want to interview and you know, uh, the user base who I want to understand what type of monetization models do they follow. You know, there's more research to be done before I would just say, here's the monetization model we do. That answer shows me that you've got a grasp of how to go about getting this answer and it's okay that you don't have the answer off the top of your head. Along with that, I think you know when we teach you whiteboarding, that's really what it is, right? There's a lot of time they'll ask you a question or they'll give you like, hey, this happened. What what do you do? And you, I, I don't know anything about Legos or something like that. And so you say, this is how I break it down. This is what I do know. This is what I don't. And that's more of like what they're looking for. So in the whiteboard challenge, you're putting it on the whiteboard, but verbally you can also do that as well. Like, 100%. Hey, this is, I figure out who our user is and they go through the needs and goals. And, and, and I think that's huge, right? Because, I don't know, in other jobs I've had, it's like very cut and dry. Yep. Tell me about time you have, uh, you know, produced so much revenue for this company, for a company. And it's like, okay, this time I did it, I put this in and it did this. Yep. Versus like, I had to figure that out, right? That's the UX side. So, you anyway. Because you're absolutely right. If you get, you know, posed a question in an interview and your answer is just flat out, I don't know. Okay, moving on. You know, it's just like, oh, oh okay. Uh, Adversely too, if you like BS them. Like, I think no one is more inclined than a UX hiring manager to sniff that out. Be like, you don't know. So it's like, it's okay if you don't know. Yep, it's the fluff and truthfully, I'm glad you've got an idea. Like sometimes I see people spit out an answer and then they'll be backpedal a little bit and say like, but I recognize that that's probably one of many options and I would want to do some more research to figure out that's a good answer too. Uh, but I, I, I find it safe in saying you don't have to have all the answers. And I think most people will agree with that. So what do you see or have you had experience What do I see as far as transitioning from UX to product management? Um, I don't know if I've got a whole lot of information on that. Because um, truthfully, I only know a couple guys who've gotten into product management from the UX background. And it's primarily been because they came from a business background. They understand how business thinks. And they couldn't find a UX position, but they found a PM position. <laughs> uh, that's typically how I see them getting into it. Uh, so how long does it take? I don't know if there's a timeline around it, but I think PMs with UX skills can be a, a tremendously valuable asset. I'll, I'll just speak to one of our PMs at Domo. Uh, what he is really good at is being close to our customers. And I haven't worked with a ton of PMs that understand that. And so this guy will set up a lot of phone calls. He'll set up a lot of insights. Uh, he'll bring me along too, so that we can kind of do these interviews together. And he understands that part of how important it is to be close to our clients. And he understands that well. And I think if you're a UX designer who understands that and you go into this PM role, you're going to be in a good spot. 
Any other questions before we wrap? I want to make sure I give you guys time to head up to that meetup as well. Okay. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, yep. If you guys want to reach out and connect, I would absolutely love it. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, shoot me a message. Say, hey, I was at the Dev Mountain thing today. Uh, I would love to connect. I would love to have, you know, be happy to answer any additional questions that you've got. Um, I will plug my podcast as well. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on any podcasting platform. I spent a ton of time talking about these soft skills. Uh, next week, I've got an interview with Lauren Treasure uh, that will be going live on Tuesday. She brought uh, one of her lead UX designers, again, Lawrence, who's a VP of product at Chatbooks. She comes from a, a PM background. Uh, and in that podcast, we talk about uh, the relationship between UX and PM. And a lot of it came back down to soft skills and collaboration. So again, if you're more interested in those soft skills and how you can improve there, I try and focus most of my topics on the podcast around that. So I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate your time.